welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing how to make college a reality for more students of diverse backgrounds with special guests, Dr. Twinette Gunn, President and CEO of Link Unlimited Scholars in Chicago, Illinois, Dr. Candace Clausen, CEO of Reach Prep in Connecticut, and Michelle Price, Executive Director of Student U in North Carolina. So thank you all for joining us. It's it's so great to have you and so important to talk about really the future of America is in our, our young people and having an access to uh, having access to a higher education is so critical to everything, everything, our economy, the lives of individuals, the, the trajectory of families. So I'm going to go over to you, Twinette, and, and give you the first cut, and then we're going to go around the room. But I want to set you up with the fact, the fact that the cost of attending a college or university has risen so sharply over the last years, and it's out of reach for so many. And we're even going to hybrid models where people aren't going to four-year colleges. First, they're going to community colleges to keep costs down and then moving into undergraduate programs. There are all sorts of different programs for uh, military and, and, and other funding for Pell Grants to, to help fund um, uh, college education, but there's still a huge gap. College is so expensive and so out of reach, and it basically creates a society that is divided along the lines of people who can afford and people who can't afford education, which means that the future of those families is kind of determined by college affordability today. So, Jeanette, talk about Link Unlimited because it was founded in uh, 1966 by John and Carolyn Palmer to make Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream a reality in their small way. Each of us has that power. We can do that today. Talk about how you were founded and where you have evolved over the last years at Link Unlimited. Yeah, thank you um, again for having us here. We are delighted to be able to talk about the um, the work that we do and certainly the need for the work that you just kind of prefaced uh, the question with. And, um, you know, almost 60 years ago, um, Link was founded to really address the, you know, inequities in our educational system here in Chicago. Um, Chicago is a major urban city, not very different than many other urban cities. And there is a real disparity in what is available in terms of quality education for um, the young people here, specifically Black students. And so um, Link was founded under that uh, premise to be able to focus solely on Black students who um, most dispro you know, disproportionately um, underrepresented and underserved, um, having the most impact from the systemic and um, you know, structural systems that have just um, kept their communities down, or I should say our communities down. And so um, the organization was founded to really try and bridge that gap um, that existed for young people all of those many years ago. Um, you know, and I would say, uh, Mark, the sad thing about it is we're almost 60 years later and we are still struggling with the same challenges. And so um, while many of us are here, you know, making our careers out of doing this much needed work, um, there's definitely so much more to be done because in 60 years we've made some progress. But, you know, I took a quick look at Dr. Martin Luther King's um, I Have a Dream speech last night, just in preparation for today and just rereading that. And it's really, um, you know, it touches the heart for so many reasons. But one of them is that many of the things that are said in there are still struggles that we're fighting today. 60 years later. And so Link and other amazing organizations are stepping up to try and bridge that gap and, and build um, uh, access and opportunities for these young people because they deserve it. Um, they're no less intelligent. They're no less talented. They are highly motivated. And if given the access and opportunity, they too can succeed and have access and uh, to, to transform their lives and their, and their futures. Well, it's for sure that people are no less talented, no less capable. There is just a question of being positioned to exercise your capabilities within society, right? And part Correct. of what you're doing, uh, Candace, is to um, build traditions within families where those traditions have been attacked for hundreds of years, right? I mean, if you look at the experience of African-Americans who were uh, punished for 
um, for becoming educated who were sanctioned. And you, you see this with Latin Hispanic uh, citizens as well. Um, you see the destruction of tradition in Native American uh, populations or in, or in Asian uh, populations. Um, how do you deal with that whole issue of building tradition when you're talking about um, young people whose families want an education but don't necessarily have the tradition of acquiring it? Yeah. So at Reach Prep, we really see ourselves as disruptors. And so we're disrupting intergenerational poverty cycles, intergenerational cycles that have excluded black and brown people from um, wealth acquisition, educational acquisition. And so we we believe that the earlier you start sort of achieving a higher level of education, the sort of you start, the sooner you start thinking about college, the sooner that you are in environments that are surrounding you with um, the proper structure and the proper access to um, different class types and different experiences, that then changes the entire trajectory of a family. So our scholars are admitted in the fourth grade. We do a 15-month academic boot camp with them, and then they earn admission into some of the top independent schools in New York and Connecticut. And so by having access to the upper echelon and to sort of the highest peaks of the educational system in our country, we know that they are then able to achieve beyond what they and their families ever imagined. And they, the beautiful thing that we do and that we, we partner with our schools to is to bring the families along as part of the journey, right? So it's not just the student is going and they're sort of excluded. It's a whole family experience. And so what we've seen is families that have achieved higher education, siblings that have gone to independent school, um, a, a higher level of bachelor's degree and master's degree acquisition within our families, just by their young scholar in fourth grade participating in this program. Um, so we're shifting families as the students are in school and as the students graduate and persist through um, independent school and college. How do you deal with the other aspects of, of financial difference? Um, you know, I, I, when, when when I was uh, when I was a kid, um, I went to a public school, and my my parents uh, went through some very difficult times. I had you know lunch coupons and those kinds of things, and I would imagine going to these elite schools, you have that those differences accentuated. Um, how do you how do you navigate that? Yeah, so our purpose is to remove that, right? So we, if a student is unable to afford a uniform or provide transportation, that is our purpose. We serve as the differentiator so that they don't feel any difference between them and their classmates and they can solely focus on their academic pursuits. Um, we sort of see everything as an education related expense. If you can't pay your mortgage and your light bill, then your scholar can't go to school. So we will sort of fund and, and provide emergency funding as, as necessary to our scholars and families. Um, we also work closely with our independent school partners. And so if, for instance, a student is granted a very generous, a very generous financially package that then extends to activities and trips. So if they're paying 90, if, the, if there's a 90% discount on tuition, there's a 90% discount on the, on the trip and on the after school program. So all of it sort of follows suit. Um, but we intentionally place our scholars in places that both partner with us that understand that they also need to contribute to the not making our scholars feel othered in those environments. And then we fill in the gaps around that um, as needed. So, Michelle, Reach Prep is, is talking about the whole young person, right? In yes. other words, surrounding, how, how do you uh, take a look, what's your cut at this, at this issue over at Student U? So at Student U, uh, we're a community organization and we use the power of education, advocacy, and leadership to help to uh, prepare our students to transform the city that we live in, which is Durham, North Carolina. Um, and we work with our students all the way from sixth grade until college graduation. So um, it is a very holistic um, approach. We also walk alongside families and support them um, in attaining um, not only education for their students, but we also do education with parents on financial literacy and um, uh, restorative practices, those kinds of things that actually help with that um, educational journey. And we also work on advocacy and we have an arm that focuses on student and family led advocacy so we can prepare students and families on also how to advocate for the, the, the issues that um, impact them. Um, so we're very intentional on social and emotional learning and having healthy environments because our students do come to us after school. And we also have a summer academy, which is five weeks during the summer where we do not only academic uh, preparation, but they're also able to explore um, interest 
that they may have in terms of whether it's the arts, uh, whether it's STEM. Um, so it's a very comprehensive program. And because we have such a long runway from sixth grade all the way through college graduation, we're able to build and sustain relationships that our students and families often lean back on when they're having questions about how to navigate uh, these systems that really, quite frankly, were not designed um, for us. And so we know that the barriers that our students face are very real. Those of us on this screen who've had to navigate those ourselves, we know how difficult it may be. Um, we might be parents. I know I have three grown children and had to navigate that space myself. And so to be able to approach it from a holistic perspective, that it's not just about the academics, that students have to feel safe in those environments, um, have to feel that they're included um, that their voices matter. And so we prepare our students to be able to go into those spaces feeling whole and feeling supported so that, um, again, when they come to us, they feel safe, but we're also preparing them that when they go back into the school systems, that they're also able to navigate um, and to advocate for themselves. How do we deal with the other skills that are so important uh, and almost preliminary to, to higher education success? Executive function skills time management, self-advocacy, right? The whole idea of walking into this strange place with this these edifices, whether it's a government office, office or a school with columns and bricks and all this other stuff, and to go in and, and have that confidence when you're turned away to persist, right? Figuring out how to be pleasantly persistent. How do you deal with, the, with those kinds of things? Because it's not just about gaining entry to school. It's also all the work happens. Staying on top of your work is really tough if if you haven't had that preparation over multiple generations of, of parents who also have gone through education. Toinette, um, could you could you uh, start us off, and then let's just talk about how do we how do we deal with these very real issues? Because it's not just done with a scholarship. It's not just done with with some um, entry into you know a, 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 an elite school, uh, Candace, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say um, what you've heard here are the tenants of really strong programs that are, um, you know, creating these wraparound or, you know, comprehensive services to be able to support students. Because um, I started working in this space over 20 years ago when, um, you know, things have shifted for the better. And 20 years ago, we didn't really understand what you're asking, Mark. Like we were just trying to get students to college. And we've learned over the years that it is more than that. And so when we design our programming or when we have you know, strengthened and rebuilt our programs, we've had to take those things into consideration. And so um, again, Link Unlimited uh, Scholars focuses exclusively on uh, black students and, um, and, that, and their plight and being able to prepare them for those spaces that you're just speaking of. And we do that through a number of ways, similar to what you just heard here from my colleagues, but it is truly, um, doing one important thing that kind of, I think, centers all of the programmatic work, and it is honing in on who they are, helping them to build that self-confidence. We have um, a whole um, approach with our students called um, U times 10, and that means that you are enough, and this program is going to give you the tools that you need to amplify the greatness within you, to be able to help you to um, amplify your voice, to be able to feel confident when you step into those spaces that you deserve there, you deserve to be there, that you matter, that you bring value. Um, and that's at the core of everything else, right? Like we can give them the academic enrichment that we do through our programming, the leadership development, the career exposure, the college access and college counseling. Um, but if they are not self-confident, if they don't have the, the feeling of I deserve to be here and I, you know, and I bring something to the table um, to enrich this community and to be able to serve this community. And I make this community better because of, you know, all that I bring to the table. Um, there are lots of hardships that come from that if you're not able to feel that in that space. And so we spend a lot of time um, helping our students to not find their voice because they come to the table with a voice. It's helping to amplify it all and to um, elevate it and to um, accelerate, you know, the, the potential and, and everything that they have inside of them. Do you all um, measure your success by graduation rates? Yes, and, right? I think those are 
absolutely integral to measuring success, but I think you have to gauge how well-rounded are your students able to critically analyze situations and work through challenging situations with peers, with classmates. Um, how is their family sort of absorbing the new learning? We do some workshops with our parents around um, adolescent brain development so they can sort of understand and, and sort of know chemically what's happening with their scholars as they're persisting through these experiences. Um, and really this idea of, are you emerging from this experience a better, well-rounded whole person that is able to impact the world in whichever way you determine, right? So a lot of our scholars will come in and they'll say, my mom wants me to be a doctor or a lawyer because that's what makes a lot of money. And then they'll graduate from college as a graphic designer and sort of navigating what that space looks like, um, having both the self-confidence to advocate for themselves with their families and their classmates, but also the confidence to emerge into a career field that they may know not nothing about. Um, that's one of the things we teach our scholars, right? The job that you that you may be best qualified for probably doesn't even exist right now. So let's focus on making you a great communicator, able to manage your time, able to work through conflict and, and build rapport with folks so that when that job becomes available, you are the best qualified person for it. So yes, college graduation rates absolutely matter, right? We know that that, has, that research has shown that that's the quickest way to the middle class, um, but there's so much more that goes along with that. And Mark, I also wanted to answer the question that you asked to um, to my colleague about um, how we support students who are navigating um, college um, at Student U. We do have staff that focus on that specifically. So not only are they supporting and preparing students before they go, we have what we call U prep days that we do. Um, about once a quarter where we're focusing on specific skills and um, FAFSA, how to complete it, you know, navigating certain environments. But after our students go to college, we have staff who actually go and visit them at their college and make sure, you know, are you, do you have friends? Do you know where your financial aid office is? Um, are you eating healthy? Do you have social outlets? So they're able to go in person and not only talk with them, you know, periodically, whether it's virtually or over the phone, but they are actually able to also go in person and see them um, in person, lay eyes on them and help them to make sure that they know how to navigate that environment. So it's the it's the prep ahead of time, but it's also let's check in while you're there. Um, we also know that for uh, first generation college students in particular, that nationwide, there's about an 11 percent retention uh, um, graduation rate in six years. Um, for students who are first generation. For student U, ours is between 54 and 55 percent. And I think part of it is because of that continuous connection of having a person that is checking on you while you are also in college. So, yeah, graduation is uh, part of it, but it's not the whole thing. But we do know that if you start a degree and don't finish and you have loans, you're going to pay back on something that's not going to pay you back. So trying to make sure that they are able to walk all the way through um, that process or change if, if, if necessary to have a person with them that's able to help navigate that um, is important um, as well. Now, our first our first poll was when we should start talking about college. And I take it from from this dialogue that your answer is, well, if you have a child, start talking about college right away in the hospital, if necessary. Right. <laughs> start talking about college as early as possible. Is that is that about right? I agree with that. But I also don't want I've heard I've experienced instances where that becomes extremely strong stressful for scholars, right? right? It's sort of like you're they're in second grade and you're already sort of pushing them toward college. So that's why we focus on skill acquisition and the ability to sort of seamlessly navigate a multitude of environments. And we do say college is the goal, but let's focus on sort of the micro instead of the macro. And as you persist toward and get closer to college, then we start talking about what is a FAFSA, what is a, a residence hall, like what, what is happening on campus. Um, we the, the foregone conclusion is always college, but we sort of take it piecemeal so that it doesn't become overwhelming because we also want them to focus on what's in front of them currently. And those environments have their own barriers and challenges that we need students to have the, the sort of bandwidth to address in that moment. You're, you're, you're making a really good point, right? I mean, the, the economy is changing. College, four-year college is, is viewed with a mixture of horror at the expense and also a question as to its uh, applicability in in a job market today in the modern uh, environment. Uh, Toinette, uh, Michelle, are you finding that to be a bit of a challenge? Are your students basically pushing back uh, a bit and saying, hey, I want to get educated, but I'm not sure that this is the actual modality? 
um, for, yeah. for my education. What are you finding, Michelle? Yeah, I think it, it. our students are very savvy. They have access to way more information than I know we had back in the day when there was a, a car catalog and people sent you pamphlets and brochures. There was no way to really compare and contrast, right, unless you had brochures and things in front of you. So our students are very savvy, but we're also able to let them know that there are some to me, getting back to the question about when do you start talking about college or career to me when they're young, let's talk about your gifts and talents. Let's talk about what you're passionate about. Let's talk about um, what things uh, bring you joy um, so that maybe your career plans might span from some of those things that you're interested in. Um, but I do think that um, letting students know that they can go the two year route. The, um, we have actually had speakers here from um, that talked about cybersecurity, for example. You don't have to have a college degree to go into cybersecurity. There's such a high need. You can get certificates in those types of um, careers that don't cost as much that will get you on a path. Uh, that really ultimately can land you um, in. And frankly, uh, in these fast moving, moving professions like cybersecurity, Absolutely. when you get to college, the people who are teaching you are outdated. The people who really know it's more of an apprenticeship kind of a kind of a situation. <laughs> Toinette, what, what is your experience? Are, are your young people uh, basically uh, coming to you and saying, look, I, I, you know, I like I like the idea of college, but it isn't the only route. How, how are you experiencing this? So Link Unlimited Scholars is, is really designed for the students who are interested in pursuing college. And so when we talk about what students come to the table with, we didn't plant this idea in their minds for them and their families. This is something that is within their reach. We're just helping them to um, access it um, and support and navigate the process. And so um, our scholars are on the path to college. Now, um, recognizing again, that there are lots of things that are changing in the world. Um, what, what we really believe in is certainly getting to them earlier. And so we do have a, um, what we call a junior link program and, and working with them as young as seventh grade. And I think um, to my colleague's point, it's about exposure, right? And so where you don't have to shove it down their throat that this is what they're going to do, like I did with my my little ones uh, when they were little and told them that you're going to college, um, but just getting them around different things to be able to spark their minds, to be able to see different things, to be able to um, get them to a point where they're thinking and questioning because, um, you know, just as uh, Michelle is saying here, they are savvy. And so they're exposed to information. They're going to ask questions. They're going to pursue different things. And what I always say is that um, I don't know how much of a future anyone has with no training or education. And that might be in a formal four-year college situation. It might be in a skilled trade set up for those students that are, you know, um, more interested in that. But there's some education involved to get you prepared for whatever that that career is going to be. And so um, whether you're doing it this way or that way. Right. And, and Link focuses on the college, the college journey. We use the data to back our work. And so we know that um, the data supports that, um, you know, young people who earn a bachelor's degree um, have the potential of increasing their lifetime earning by a million dollars. And so um, I remember when that. Um, data first hit and being able to use that to say, would you like to make a million dollars at, you know, in your lifetime? And for many of us in our families, that is not the case. When you talk about that intergenerational cycle of poverty, this is the thing that can really change the trajectory of their lives and in, in getting that education that it's still the overwhelming way to do it. Um, but it doesn't mean that there aren't other ways. Our focus is college. You know, I'm not insensible to the fact that we have here four colleagues talking about a common uh, issue in America. We have uh, uh, three women, three women of color, one white guy. Um, when we're talking about the future of the country, are your young people sensible to the fact that they are the consumers of the future? They are the people who will shape the products. They are the people who will secure our networks. They are the people who will make the decisions that will actually shape the future of the world. Are they preparing themselves? And I know they each of them live in our own bubbles, particularly at that age, right? They live in their, the bubbles of their families and their communities and their own experiences. But are, is there a sensibility about the fact that, that this is actually a way to um, amplify 
their voice in the world, uh, Candice. Is, is, is there that kind of excitement and that kind of consciousness? Yeah, absolutely. Our scholars have a deep understanding and appreciation of sort of the world as it is and the world as it could be. They see the mistakes that have been made. They see the environment. They see crime. They see laws. They see everything that sort of has happened to them that they had no control over. And they have a, an increased sense of, of fidelity to ensuring that the world that they will take over and the world that they will then leave behind is exponentially better than the world that exists now. We have a, a lot of students that do service learning. Uh, service is just a huge part of our ethos as an organization, right? As, as we are lifting others, we want to, as we are lifting our scholars, we want to lift their communities around them. Um, and they, they understand deeply that, that that is sort of like their honor and, and they are happy to do it. I know that, you know, young people to your point are in their own bubbles and they may sort of be unaware of the totality of the issues that are happening across the world, but they're very keen on what's happening in their own communities and their own families, especially since we serve black and Latinx students. And so they are keenly aware of the issues facing those communities, absolutely. Are they and I believe Mar Marshall? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I, I'm i sorry, Candace. Uh, oh, no, I thought he was asking me a question. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, as, as a person who is, um, you know, my all of my children are grown and I spent most of my career in direct services work, but there's still um, the mother in me that feels like we still as adults have a responsibility to, yes, prepare students for what they're supposed to do as, as adults and the things that we prepare them uh, to do, you know, when they go to school, but that burden, I don't, to me, I don't think that the burden should be on them only. I think it should be on us as adults. And I also think it needs to be on the people who hold power. I think there's a reason why this stuff continues. And that's because the power structures that made all of this stuff happen 400 years ago, those power structures are still very secure right now. And it's almost like those of us who are trying to change systems, I've given the analogy, it's, it's like we got a handful of gravel throwing it at these huge brick buildings and we're making a nick, but it's not breaking the system down. So the people who hold power also have a responsibility here. And we can't put it all on the shoulders of our children without having those who hold the power, who make the laws, who have policies in place. We have to hold them accountable as well. Make the argument that it is actually beneficial to the people who hold power, to cede power. Can you make that argument? It, you're, 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 you're locking out gifts, talents, passions, potential that impact not only the marginalized populations and communities that we might be coming from, but you're missing out on things that could benefit the systems um, that really traditionally were created to keep us locked out. You're missing, you're missing gifts and talents um, and passion an opportunity. You're missing out too. Not only do we miss out, but you miss out as well. Lynette, could you make the argument that that it is beneficial for the powerful to cede power? Absolutely. I think it's all rooted in the fact that the world is changing, right? And um, if in fact, you know, I believe that the students that we're leading today will sit in these seats at some point, um, it's important that we, one, recognize that, right, that there is a, a real transition of the next generation stepping in. Um, and that is a, you know, conceding of the power, so to speak, right? And, and they're stepping in. Um, and how do we ensure that they're going to be prepared to do it? How do we ensure that what they're going to step in and do is going to benefit us and the community as a whole. Um, and I just feel that we have to double down on our investments in um, teaching and training and educating our young people because, I mean, if, you know, not to be morbid, but if by no other reason we are not going to live forever, someone has to step in and take over that power. And for those folks that are in power, you know, their, their way has been to just pass it on to their generations. But again, that excludes the, the diversity and the equity and inclusion piece. Um, that is so important. We know, again, if we look at data and research and what it tells us when we diversify and we, we, when we are inclusive, um, our bottom lines are stronger, you know, our ideas are brighter. We are able to look at what we were able to do in, in the midst of a pandemic that we had not seen in a hundred years, right? That we were able to put our minds together and come to the table and change things in our organizations, in our world. Um, people on the front line were 
not the most educated, not the most, um, you know, upper upper class, figuring out how to do these things. And so that equity, that uh, diversity, that inclusion is so important in figuring out the next steps for us. Um, and this generation, these, this, this younger generation, they're going to be the ones, you know, and I, I hold a lot of promise that they're going to help us figure this stuff out that we have not been able to figure out. It is going to be them. And I hope that I am alive to be able to see, see that with my kids and my grandchildren someday um, to be able to figure out some of these very complex challenges that I will say we haven't wanted to figure out because we're, you know, an intelligent society that some of these things, if we really wanted to, um, as Candace said, disrupt things and, and, and get them changed, we could. And so these systems that we work against, Michelle, um, I say all the time, they're operating in the way that they were designed to operate, to be, you know, exclusive, right? To keep people out and they continue to operate that way. But we're learning that is not the way to do it when the world is comprised of so many different people. We have to be more inclusive. Absolutely. Candace, we'll give you the last word. What do you, what do you think the future holds for your students? And, and is it really in the interests of us all, all of us, to advance your students? The world is a better place with diverse ideas, diverse perspectives, diverse people. The, the it, organizations make more money. Classroom learning is exponentially improved. Um, and really, quite frankly, like it makes things more interesting, right? If we all look the same, we all eat the same food, we all wear the same clothes, like it's not, it's boring. Like we got to keep it spicy, right? Like life is too short for us to have have a singular focus and a singular type of person and a singular mind frame. Um, and so I know that my scholars and my colleague scholars will all have a direct impact on improving the state of the world. Um, and they will absolutely be change agents. And I'm personally very excited to watch how they grow and expand and, and see the world morph into what we all know it should be, um, but hasn't quite gotten there yet. Well, without being naive, my answer is that it's much more fun to learn from people by talking with them than it is to circle the wagons and looking at each other with suspicion at a distance. Wouldn't it be great if we could all really exchange, see, learn from each other's perspectives without demanding that your perspective conform to mine, right? Share a little bit, benefit from the knowledge of others, we could make the country better. We could make communities better. And that's what you're doing. Dr. Twinette Gunn, President CEO of Link Unlimited Scholars in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Candace Clausen, CEO of Reach Prep in Connecticut. And Michelle Price, Executive Director of Student U in North Carolina. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, you. for the work of your people, for the work of your students, for the work of their parents, for the work of your donors. Thank you, thank you, thank you for helping to strengthen the country and to strengthen the future of students. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good opportunity. Take care.